If you are considering having cataract surgery, what are the questions you should be asking? In this episode of OcuTalk, we'll be talking to Dr. David Felstead about the different types of cataract surgery, the risks involved, and the importance of postoperative care, including the use of steroids after surgery to prevent inflammation. Dr. Felstead? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a brand new episode of OcuTalk. My name's Nick, and today we have a very special guest joining us from Barnett Delaney Perkins Eye Center in Arizona, Dr. David Felstead. Dr. Felstead, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be on. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you again for joining us. We know you're very busy, uh, but just wanted to kind of introduce yourself a little bit beforehand. Uh, do you mind actually uh, letting our audience know a little bit about your background and your specialty? Sure. Um, so my name is Dr. David Felstead. I am a comprehensive cataract and refractive surgeon based in Northern Arizona. Um, I'm currently entering into my second year of practice and I um, practice a broad scope in ophthalmology. So mainly cataract, refractive, um, but also some microinvasive glaucoma and then dry eye disease, which is very prevalent up here in Northern AZ. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for that, doctor. And again, thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, with us. Uh, so for our discussion today, we were hoping that maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, cataract surgery and kind of like the post-operative um, measures that can be taken into place for to get optimal results for your patients. So before we get started on that, could you just let our viewers know a little bit about uh, cataracts? Sure. Um, so a cataract is a natural clouding of the human lens inside the eye. And it can happen for many, many reasons. The most common reason that I see in my practice is nuclear uh, sclerotic cataracts, which is due to aging, um, celebrating too many birthdays. Um, we also see a lot of patients with diabetes um, who take steroids or um, medications, and that can cause a cataract. Um, and then in my area of the country, I see a lot of traumatic cataracts. Um, so, you know, it can be caused from various, various reasons, but the most common is aging. Well, perfect. Thank you for that, Dr. Felstead. And... Um... When is surgery recommended to treat cataracts? Uh, surgery is recommended anytime uh, your daily activities are being impacted by your vision, and that is deemed to be from a cataract. And so it's really important for patients to get in and see their local ophthalmologist um, and get a detailed, thorough exam to figure out, you know, is the cataract that's causing the vision changes? Is it something in the retina or something on the cornea? And they can walk you through all of that, take some measurements, and um, talk to you about your choices uh, and lens options. Excellent information, Dr. Felstead. Thank you for that. And can you tell us a little bit about the different cataract surgeries and, and how they work exactly? Yeah, so cataract surgery has got a really neat and vibrant history dating all the way back to the Egyptians. Um, back when um, patients would get advanced cataracts, they would lose their vision and lose their ability to see even light and color. Um, Egyptians would take a long needle and they would poke the center of the cataract um, through the cornea and push it into the back of the vitreous cavity. And that um, practice was called couching. Um, and so that helped patients at least see light and color. Um, and then for many, many years, that's kind of the, the mode of treatment, um, all the way up until you know, the 20th century when they started doing you know, these large um, corneal scleral incisions um, to remove the cataract. And then patients um, did not have any lens choices at that point. And we're given um, these big, thick glasses. Your grandparents or um, elderly patients may have them still, um, called a fake spectacles. Um, and so that was the mode of treatment until about World War II, when Sir Hild Ridley from England noticed that British Spitfire pilots um, were getting their cockpit glass blown up in their face, and that plexiglass was inert inside the eye. It didn't do anything. And so he had the brilliant idea to create a lens out of that same material and implant it inside the eye. Um, and although the first models were not very successful, it was a great concept and it has since advanced and taken off to the point today where we have all sorts of advanced technology lenses that can help patients you know, see far, near and everything in between. Um, and it's just been an exciting journey to watch from my perspective as a new surgeon. So um, I think you know, to more fully answer your question, um, now today we do surgery under two different modalities, um, either with diamond keratome bladed incisions 
or um, with portions of surgery done with a femtosecond laser. Um, both have their pluses and minuses, and I think they're both great modalities of treatment and need to be tailored to each patient specifically. Um, but the idea of the femtosecond laser is that it can recreate some of the steps during surgery, like the incisions. Um, it can cut the capsule of the cataract, which is the very you know, outer shell, um, and it can make a perfect circle. And then it can cut the lens into pieces, um, depending on how the surgeon wants to do it. And that makes some of the steps of surgery a lot easier, a little bit more predictable, and much more accurate. Um, now, most surgeons, and myself included, can recreate all those steps very similarly with their hands. Um, the difference is the laser can do it in microns, and we can do it in millimeters. So does that answer your question? That, that, that definitely answers my question. Thank you so much. And we got a great history lesson there on cataract surgery. Thank you for that, Dr. Felstead. Um, and so... For the patient's view, uh, what risk uh, should the patients be aware of uh, before they go in for cataract surgery? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, the risks, fortunately, are very low for an experienced surgeon. And so I think, you know, preoperatively, patients should be looking for a surgeon who does a lot of cases on a weekly basis. Um, and I think for those surgeons, their risks are very, very low, less than probably 2%. Um, and I think if you look in the, in the literature and the, on the internet, you're going to find anywhere between a two and a 5% risk of complication, uh, which means 95%, 98% of the time, you're going to have a great outcome. Even in the small patient population that has complications, um, most of the time vision can be restored. Um, you know, we always tell patients that you can expect a little bit of inflammation after surgery. That's very common. Um, but the main things that would take away vision would be things like infection or bleeding, which are exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. Um, drooping eyelid, dislocation of the artificial lens, retinal detachment, glaucoma, and secondary cataract are also on the list of things that are um, risk factors. But again, they're very rare. Well, perfect. Again, thank you for that, Dr. Felstead. I appreciate that. And um, what I'm curious about is why are steroids used after cataract surgery? Yeah, I think that's a really important question to ask. Um, so the lens, when it is developed inside our eye um, from birth, uh, our body doesn't see that material, okay? So when we do cataract surgery, all of a sudden our body is exposed to something new it's never seen before, and it has a, an immune response to it, uh, an inflammatory reaction. We also introduce instruments inside the eye, fluids, ultrasonic energy, medications, all of those things can cause the delicate tissues inside the eye to become inflamed and interact. Um, and so it's very, very important after surgery to control that inflammation and get it um, as low as possible so that the patient can have a faster recovery, vision can improve quicker, um, and then we can decrease any risk of um, inflammation damaging the inside of the eye, which is delicate. Perfect, excellent. Again, thank you for that information. I appreciate that, Dr. Felstead. And uh, when we're talking about different options for uh, steroids for cataract surgery, what are those different options uh, for steroids? Yeah, it's a, um, another really relevant question to uh, today and the evolution of cataract surgery. Um, most patients are presented with three or four different options, and it depends on the surgeon and what they like to do. Um, the most traditional option is just as a low potency topical steroid like prednisolone acetate. Um, that is well tolerated by the general community. Um, patients take it three to four times a day for a month and then are tapered off of it slowly as to um, make sure that there's no problems with the medication. Um, there's a lot of pharmacies that now compound medications together um, because one of the main issues with topical steroids is patients can forget to take it or maybe they can't get it inside their eye. It can be difficult to do that. Um, and so there's some compound of medications that include an, a, to, a topical antibiotic as well as a steroid. And that increases compliance and makes it a little bit easier on the patient. Um, I found in my practice that intracameral steroids are an easy way to ensure that patients get the medication, that they don't have to worry about taking it, and I can ensure the compliance is there. Um, and there's um, intracameral dexamethasone as well as intracanalicular dexamethasone. And let me explain the difference between the two. Um, intracameral dexamethasone is a steroid that is implanted inside the eye at the very end of surgery. Uh, it kind of looks like a little snowball or like a little pearl of medicine that we inject at the very end of the case. And that medicine um, sticks around for about a month and it slowly dissolves and it gives just the right amount of steroid for the patient over that time period. Um, where I train and practice, uh, my patients are coming from three, four hours away at times. And so it's easy to put the medication in and make sure that they get it. 
Um, the other medication, intracanalicular dexamethasone, is a similar idea with a little bit different um, modality. The medication comes in a pellet, and that pellet is then inserted into the very bottom lower lid, where the hole goes from the lid down into the nose. Um, and so that hole, we put a little a little plug-in of that medication, and it'll sit and dissolve over the next month um, across the tear surface of the eye. Um, and so both are great treatments. Um, I've used them both, and in my hands, they both work very well. Well, perfect. Like, we're learning a lot today, and uh, thank you again for the lessons, Dr. Bell said. I appreciate that. And uh, for your uh, post-operative um, kind of, uh, what, are, what are your post-operative measures to help prevent any complications and kind of achieve those optimal results for your patients? Sure, I think it's really important to um, keep an open communication channel for the patient. So each of my patients will go home with a very detailed post-operative instruction sheet that's easy for them to understand and read, as well as an important phone number at the bottom. They can call day or night with any problems and it goes straight to a triage nurse. Um, I'm very, very sensitive to any pain or symptoms that are alarming. Um, and I wanna see those patients right away. And I really believe that if you catch a patient early with problems, you can prevent so many other issues down the, down the road. Um, and so for me, you know, post-operative measures um, include just holding the patient's hand and staying close by them, um, making sure they understand that you're there to treat them and to help them have a great experience with their cataract surgery. Um, I think, you know, overall, I want all my patients to be happy with their vision. And I think, you know, making myself available to them, giving them the opportunity to ask questions both preoperatively and postoperatively and um, letting them know I'm there for them is really important. Definitely. Thank you again, Dr. Bell said we appreciate that. And um, are there any new technologies or new developments that are on the horizon right now that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, I think it kind of comes down to three different domains, um, intraocular lenses, um, machinery and mechanics during surgery, and then postoperative medications. Um, so, you know, I think as far as intraocular lenses, we're going to continue to see an extended depth of focus lens that offers the ability for patients to see trifocality, um, which means far in the middle and up close. Um, they're already coming out with those lenses now, and I think they're going to continue to improve and become better and better. Um, and it's amazing, you know, what's already out there on the market. Um, the second is intraoperative mechanics. Um, what I mean by that is robotic surgery. I think in the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to see an increased use of robotic assist, and um, that will help speed up uh, the surgeries. It'll help in increase reliability and accuracy of the surgery and hopefully safety profiles. Um, so I think that's coming down the pipeline. Um, I think you're also going to see increased ease of use of these medications for steroid use. Um, right now, they're, they're a little bit tricky to implant inside the eye, and unless you have enough experience with them, um, some surgeons will struggle. Um, and so I think the ease of use of those medications will increase as they figure out easier ways to implant them. And um, the medications themselves will become more potent and less reactive for the patient. Well, excellent. We will definitely be on the lookout for all those, Dr. Felstead. And uh, before we leave today, was there anything else that you would like to tell our audience? Um, I think I was just uh, grateful to be a part of the um, journey here in ophthalmology. I think we're at an exciting point in time where we're going to see a lot of growth within this field as the next generation needs eye care. Um, and so it's, it's fascinating and exciting to be a part of this. So thank you. Well, no, thank you, Dr. Felstead. We appreciate that. Everyone, that was Dr. David Felstead with uh, Barnett. Delaney and Perkins Eye Center in Arizona. Dr. Felstead, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good one. Thank you.